this is Joe Alt with this pick. Um, praise be to Alt. Praise, praise Alt. <laughs> so, <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> praise be to Alt. 80,000 impressions later. Uh, what is it? We pray at the the Alt. <laughs> Swing and a miss. <laughs> I saw what you were going for. I see the vision. It yeah. didn't manifest itself, but you I know, hope we, that's not the we, open. We got to go back. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope that's not the open. I might need a week off. Welcome to the opening bell of the NFL Stock Exchange Podcast. I'm Trevor Sikova. That is Connor Rogers. Joining you guys for a midweek, late week edition of the podcast. It's holidays, folks. You got to work with us. Today, we're doing offensive tackle rankings. We're getting to the big beauties. Remember, it's not the big uglies. If you're watching the podcast this summer, you know that we don't call them big uglies. We call them big beauties here on this podcast. But we are updating our offensive tackle rankings. We're going to go through our top fives. Plus, of course, you guys know the show. We like to talk a lot, so we're going to talk about some guys who are outside of the top five as well as college football regular season and declarations have happened for these guys. So, Connor, how you doing, my friend? I'm good, man. An exciting class today. A lot of tackle help on the way to the NFL, which is a really good sign. If you've watched NFL football this year, especially some of these lines that have injuries, it is we needed this one really, really badly. (laughs) And I'm excited for when after the combine we do our top 10 15s however many we rank because i know you and you and i are going to have a extended combo today about the guys outside the top five that also have a lot of promise so yeah man i'm i'm good and i'm excited to talk about this group that has uh quite a few first round picks you watching this offensive tackle class is like a dad watching the rain roll in you're just like we needed this we you needed know, we, this we, man. Just, we needed this you're looking around at everyone you're like you're smiling. You're like, thank God it's finally here. You know, this year has been a big reminder that offensive tackle, not that anybody forgot, of course, like football won and lost in the trenches. We all obviously know that that cliche, but it is true. And offensive tackle is a premium position for a reason, because yeah. not only are these guys so pivotal when they are out there, when they get hurt. The win above replacement for these players, oh. the drop off that your entire offense can have if just one of your starting five gets hurt. I mean, it can be devastating for you. So we have seen over the last, not that they're the first team to ever do this, but we a lot of people talk about Howie Roseman and how he has built the Philadelphia Eagles. Building those trenches, always making sure he is one step ahead of the game, like that's something that I think we are going to see general managers be more aggressive towards as the years go on, or certainly I think over the next five years or so. And this class is a perfect class to be able to do that because there are some phenomenal athletes in this one. And I guess we could just get right to it because I figure five is going to be a fantastic athlete for at least one of us. Maybe it's the same player. Who knows? We'll see. Connor, after watching some of the regular season film from these guys, who do you got at number five here in your re-rankings in the uh, early parts of of, of full-on draft season? So I will establish this with that you and I are going to talk about Troy Fontenot and uh, Graham Barton with the interior players. Both of them have played tackle at college. I know we've had some conversations that, hey, maybe these guys hold up at tackle at the next level. But throughout much of this process from, I don't want to say consensus because maybe that's dangerous, but almost consensus, they're going to be evaluated as guys projected to move inside. Mm Mm-hmm. So don't get bent out of shape if you don't. I'm, I'm, gl- I'm glad that you said that at the top of the show because we were going to get yelled at. We were absolutely well, going to so, like, get yelled at. Really good players. Yeah. And yeah, I don't want them to get lost in the shuffle here. So I started at five with somebody that I did like over summer um, and would be in the NFL if he hadn't torn his ACL in 2022. And that's Jordan Morgan. And okay. somebody, you know, who has played a lot of football. And one of my big takeaways from doing this exercise, Trevor, was that a lot of these guys have not played a lot of college football, honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, plenty of them two-year starters and stuff like that, which is fine. But Jordan Morgan is somebody that he's logged over 2,000 snaps at left tackle in college. I I mean, significant playing time as an underclassman and even with the torn ACL on the back end of 2022, he must have worked his ass off to come back ready to roll this year. Not only did was he ready to roll, he looked – the tape is good this year. I, like, I agree. I, I agree. I, I watched him, and I was like – my expectations were 
a little bit tempered because I liked him so much last year and, and that, you know, during summer scouting. But I thought like, man, it's going to take a little bit to come back. It's a re- it's a tough injury, especially a tackle, the pressure on the knee. And, and it's really, really good. I just like how he shows off his strength. This is a guy that he he is compact. He is not a dripping long tackle with the arms down to the ground or super tall. He's a more compact player. And he has a lot of mass packed in to the center of his body that he knows how to utilize. Like when he wins leverage, he knows how to use that mass to help his anchor. And he has very active hands. Like I wrote this down from the summer and then I rewrote it again this time. He does not wait for the battle to come to him. And mm-hmm. I just love that. So some guys in this class, that's actually a problem is that they overextend, they reach, they lunge, they they duck their head. They're just so jittery out of the gate. With Jordan Morgan, it is, it's active and anxious, but I think it's controlled because he's played so much. So he has yeah. good hand placement. He has pretty good technique. Uh, I think he has plus awareness. I think that he's somebody that it's not the same footwork as some of the high-end guys, but it's good enough where he's able to mirror with those feet. But where he makes his money, Trevor, his ability in the zone running game is phenomenal. Phenomenal. He gets out of the gate. He gets downfield on screens. He can pull. He could just run to the second level and and try to detonate people. And that's because he plays with an edge. He really Mm -hmm. plays with an edge. So Jordan Morgan is somebody that we could have had him on the guard show as well i think he's going to get a shot at tackle and i think he's earned that and i think if you're a very zone heavy team you are probably going to love him in the back end of the first round or in the first half of the second round yeah so i have jordan morgan at six so i'd see him pretty similarly to you do or as as you do i think what did i give him i think i gave him a late first early second grade it might have right. been a solid second round grade but it, 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 it's right around there and i agree with a lot of the stuff that you said you mentioned he tore his acl in what was it november i think it was november of yeah. last year yep he played more snaps this season than he had in any singular season before this he played he's he's been a starter for three years and that that like that's truly saying something folks in 2021 he played 706 snaps in 2022 he played 670 because he missed a little bit after that torn acl and then this past year, he played 787. It's crazy. It talks about the, like the work ethic this guy has, the type of athlete he has, or the, the type of athlete that he is for him to be able to recover and get to this point. A super impressive player. I love the experience, love the patience as well. I think the footwork is fantastic. My my The thing that I love the most about Jordan Morgan is the footwork is so good. The consciousness to the leverage is so good. He mirrors so well. And... There is, I think, an argument, does he have the redirect strength and natural power to be able to sit on an island by himself against some NFL pass rushers? But when it comes to that quickness, staying in front of guys, when you have more space in front of you, that's sometimes a detractor of why guys might not be able to survive a tackle. That's not the case with Jordan Morgan. Like this dude can move super well. And if the only thing you're really worried about is, man, does he have the total like redirection power to when he's facing those bull rushes? Is he going to expose his inside or outside shoulder without having help on either side? That might be a reason that I could say, okay, maybe he's going to be a starter at guard at the next level. Because if you eliminate that, you just got a damn fine offensive lineman. You, you mentioned he's not going to he's not going to be dominant with his length. He's not going to be dominant with his just overall size. But there's so much to like about his game. He approaches the offensive line position very, very well. Love the balance. He has a little bit of a track and field background, and so I think that he's got the extra core strength. Hey, shot put, you know, but st- so it's not quite like the wrestling background that we like with our trench players, but still shot put, man. I mean, you've got to, yep. you've got to be able to, uh, to control the body and that takes some core strength too. I think that he absolutely takes that to the football field. So I have him in number six. I like him similarly the way that you do, but I do wonder if he is going to be one of those guard tackle tweeners because you know, when guys are really getting into his chest at the NFL level, 
is he able to is he going to be able to truly like redirect what they're doing because right, he can stay in front of them uh, yeah about, about he, as, right he, not as good as any tackle. he almost bellies in front of them and, he, and he, it, it's, it's just it's super impressive how controlled and how well he's able to do that but the nfl game is a game of power it's game of strength it is some of the strongest athletes in the world playing their positions especially at the defensive end spots so um I wonder if that ultimately pushes him into guard, but either way, I think he is a starting caliber offensive lineman at the next level. So I agree. So who'd you have at five? So five for me, opposite of Jordan Morgan, much more of a projection player. I have Georgia's right tackle, Amarius Mims at okay. number five. For me. We could package this one because I have him at four. Okay. So six foot seven. 330 to 340 pounds, depending on where you look. I yeah, mean, the Godzilla. guy is just an alien type of build, man. And when you see him on the field at right tackle, he gets down in that stance and you go, holy shit. Like, what? <laughs> where is Georgia getting Dude. these guys? It's really funny when you watch the 2022 tape because so Amarius Mims, he was a five star offensive tackle didn't start his first year, thought about transferring, ended up coming back to Georgia. He doesn't get a starting spot right away after that because, well, it's Georgia and they're deep as hell. But when Warren McClendon got hurt towards the postseason last year, Mims was able to step in and play. So I think it was, wasn't it the SEC championship and then the college football playoff? The Ohio where- State game was a big one for him. Yes, but I think he pl- he started in the LSU game as well, and then he started yep. for the Ohio State game too. And so you get to see him on the field at the same time as Broderick Jones on the other side. And you're just like, how did this happen? How did we let this happen? How does one team That's what they do. have both of these offensive tackles? So it's kind of funny to see both of those guys out there. Uh, Mims obviously passes all of the size tests with flying colors. I don't think there's going to be any talk of like, oh, you know, is he a guard? Is he a tackle? He is clearly built for the tackle position. He's just very, very green on experience because this year – he was scheduled to be a starter at right tackle, ends up suffering a high ankle sprain early in the season. I think it was that third game against South Carolina. He misses six games, and then he re-injured it against Alabama in the SEC championship game, so we don't even get that full game. Um, we we don't, obviously don't get the bowl game from him either. Over the last two years, he has only played 682 snaps, which is just not a lot of football. No, there's just not a lot of experience in there and you see it. You know, I think that you see the lack of, of, you know, he's got the athleticism to do things, but just the footwork being married with how your time and your punches in your hands and, and how you are truly using the, the, the power from your lower body through the upper half of your body. What happens when players do a certain pass rush move against you? Cause he is winning by just being a, a, a pterodactyl right now. He, he is winning by simply being, a crazy athlete at six foot seven, 340 pounds. But the technique parts of his game, even this year at the beginning of the year, the hand placement, I mean, there's sometimes when the hands are just coming way too wide and he's given up his chest a lot easier. You know, when guys will counter him, he doesn't really know how to reset his hands the way that he should. So he's not as comfortable hand fighting. I mentioned the feet don't always look as coordinated, but all that to say, those are things that can get fixed. And those are things that often get fixed when you get snaps. So Mims might not be a player that you want to throw out there right away. I think he'll ultimately be a first round offensive tackle just because yeah. God don't make many like him. Yeah. But I don't think you're going to want to throw him out there in year one, week one, because I think you're going to, there's going to be some, some big time growing pains there. And if you're a team that, Hey, maybe you're not in a winning window. You can afford to do that. Fine. Cause there's nothing like live bullets. There's nothing like regular season snaps, but because of that inexperience, you're going to see the blemishes of his, of his game. If you really, if you, if you really get him out there early. So that's kind of the way that I viewed him, the, the mold of a player that you absolutely want to take uh, in the first round, because if you hit it, man, you're going to hit it big, but There's just so much refinement that you need to have from him. And I'll also throw this out there. When I watched him back-to-back with Broderick Jones, I liked Broderick Jones more than I like Amarius Mims. I want to be very clear about that. Like, they're both total freak athlete types of players, but 
I had a firm first round grade yeah. on Jones, who was sort of the same narrative, right? Sort of the same, like, hey, here's a freak athlete who just is really young, still needs to get more snaps. I think Amarius Mims is further away. And I also where I think he's bigger, a little bit bigger and longer than Broderick Jones. I don't think he's as explosive as Broderick Jones is either. And it was easy to see those two in those back-to-back games. You can watch both of them out of the corner of your eye, or you could go back to see him. Jones is firing off the ball, especially when it comes to run blocking. And Mims is athletic, just not as twitchy as Jones was, which I think you know, you're going to hear a lot of people bring those two guys up because they played in the same school and they have a lot of the same thought process with their scouting reports. But I want to be clear, I do like Broderick more than I like Amarius Mims. But what do you think of him? I think that's a good call out. And Broderick was able to play his whole season as a starter, which is a big deal. It helped him get better. And I, I'm with you. I had Broderick as the 15th overall player in last year's draft class. Firm first round grade. He's looked really good for the Steelers. With Mims, how he ended up at four for me, it's, I mean, you nailed it. It's a projection, right? Like this is somebody that it is all there and it's always all been there. And I think what not bothered me on tape, but what left me wanting more on tape is, and this is probably a confidence thing because of not playing enough for how big he is and the kind of athlete he is. He has really no drive and finish in the run game. Like there's not a lot of examples. I mean, this dude's six, seven, three forty, and it's a good three forty. It's not mm-hmm. a sloppy three forty. Like this is an athlete three forty. You turn on the run tape and you're like, man, he's going to get his hands on somebody. And like, they're going to go flying. And you just never get that. You never get that. And I don't think it's lack of like heart or ability. I just think that he has not played enough to the point where he doesn't have that confidence yet to just uncork off the snap and land on his target and demolish them. Like he he just wants to do complete his assignment, right? He wants to make sure he makes the block and it's good enough. And this is greedy as from a scouting lens, but you want more when you're looking for the NFL level. Like I want this guy to be a destroyer. I think in pass pro, this goes back to the lack of experience as well. And it's, he's a little anxious. He leans and ducks and gets off balance and and he's just massive. Like that's going to happen. Yeah. But you're, he, you can't run through him. I I mean, I couldn't find somebody just bullying him. No. So I'm like, you don't need to leave trust your core strength like you don't need to lean and duck they can't run through you they cannot run through you and that's why i'm at four is because i believe in him like if he goes to the right coaching staff this guy and can stay healthy because he had the tightrope on his ankle this year this guy has everything he's explosive into his stance i agree broderick was the way he moved was different but i keep reminding myself mims is six seven three forty Right. right. That is right. that's dense. That yeah. is really, really dense. I think he's explosive into his stance. I think that a, a very like subtle thing I wrote down, but I liked when they scored and he was out on the field, his energy is phenomenal. He's so excited. He's so into it with his teammates. Like the passion, you could tell he was so happy to be out there playing and being a part of it. I, I really liked because that's something if I don't know what a guy is, cause he's played started six games this year, he played seven. Like I, I need to worry about those little things because mm-hmm. do you give a shit? Like, are you going to care enough to get better? Right, right, because if right. you do like, this is an all pro baseline. Here. I agree. Like, so I had him at four because I, I have a big projection on him. Um, I wish we could have gotten to see more. It makes our jobs harder, but NFL teams are going to fall in it, as long as they believe in him. They're going to fall in love with him because you nailed it, Trevor. They just don't make them like this. They don't. Yeah. yeah. And Except at Georgia where they clearly do. Yeah, where they, where they clearly do. Right. No, I I, I I, do. I love the call out about him celebrating with his teammates and, and obviously caring because caring is going to hold the key to does he achieve his potential? Because, yeah, you look at some of the stuff. I didn't I, I didn't know a lack of of punch or or power or maybe like mean streak the way that you did but i did note some clunkiness with his footwork and maybe some lack of punch at at contact that might have come from that lack of confidence where you're just a little bit hesitant like i haven't i haven't seen this i haven't done this enough before yep. where maybe more snaps holds the key to that does your footwork get cleaner when 
you're not thinking about a million things. You know, are, are you just you know, you're just going about business as usual? Because if we get this guy to go about business as usual, yeah, he's an all pro. He's going to be an all pro at the NFL level. He he has that ability. His stride length is good. His 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 strength overall, I think, is good, but could be even better. So for a baseline, it's it's just this is the kind of player that does not get out of the top fifty. I think that he's going to be a first round pick because of the things that we mentioned. But um, yeah, so you have him at number four. I'm at four. Who do you have at four? Um, so I have I have JC Latham at four. All right, here's our conversation. So you ha- so you have JC Latham. I'm guessing outside of your top five. Yeah, I did a uh, written in pen uh, pencil top eight, knowing you know we're gonna do the top five pretty confidently, mm-hmm. barring one of these guys having a disastrous combine. Yeah, I had G- Tyler Guyton at six. And Latham at seven. <sighs> All right. So, I mean, it's, but once again, like this is a really good tackle class. Like I don't, think, I don't look at Latham. The year we had Trevor Penning, and everybody knew he was going in the top twenty. And I had Penning, yeah, not I, even I, at the top of day day two. I was like, same. like, what is going on here? I don't yeah. feel that way about Latham, but there's clearly a little bit of a difference because I know Latham is a top fifteen player for a lot of people, and I. Mm. I wouldn't feel great about taking him in the first round. So I'll preface it by saying this. I didn't watch Latham until this morning and we're cut. We're recording this on Thursday and I did not watch Latham until this morning because he had not declared for the draft yet. So I kind of held off on a couple of players. He, since I think it was this morning, actually declared for the NFL draft. And so I was like, okay, good. I got, I was going to watch him anyways for the show, but I was glad that I waited to actually get that confirmation. So I'm coming off of the Michigan game where one of the main reasons why that last play of the game, Alabama versus Michigan, went as poorly as it did is because six foot six, 360 pound JC Latham is getting forklifted into the backfield by a player who is half his size. Yeah. Not actually half his size, but you guys know what he I looks mean. Like guy that he should absolutely dominate and so i'm like damn man that's a top 15 pick i don't know about that that's the biggest play of the game and he gets absolutely forklifted so i went into this thinking that i would be where you are and i i want to you out on it but then i watched two games of 22 four games of 2023 and i'm like god this guy's good like yeah. he's just like he's just got it all. So JC, so JC Latham, right tackle for Alabama. I mentioned it. Six foot six, 360 pounds. Healthy young man, as Benjamin Solak would say. Five star offensive line prospect. Uh ended up going to IMG Academy before he went to Alabama. Played in 14 games as a backup his true freshman year at Alabama. In 2022, he was the team's starting um right tackle. No way he played guard, I think. I think he played guard and he started at guard or he filled in at guard and then he played right tackle and he has been the right tackle as a starter ever since. So he has played three seasons for Alabama. One of them, he was a guard. The last two, he was at right tackle. So he's got that offensive guard, right tackle versatility, which is nice because when you look at him, you go, oh, that's a big boy. Is he going to be a guard? Like what's going on here? But then you watch him play and you go, okay, he's got the arm length and it's from the jump. It is so impressive how well Latham moves at 360 pounds. Last year, he weighed 330, reportedly. Now he weighs 360. And you watch both seasons, and he's just extremely explosive. I love the flexibility that he has in his hips to be able to get down low in a more athletic stance. I love how explosive he is with that first step and his kick slide to get exactly where he needs to get to. Again, at 360 pounds, he understands um hand placement he I've, I've even seen him going from 2022 to 2023 i'd see him get a little hand flash in there to bait these guys and then get his hands on them and you can't really get off the grip once he gets right into you i think the power at the point of attack is absolutely imposing especially again in that michigan game i went back and i made sure i watched that michigan game there are so many more plays that Latham is the reason why they were successful than they were that last play of the game. That last play of the game stings and it sucks. And honestly, it's a bit of a theme for him over the last couple of years, which I'll get to in a second. But there are so many times where 
he was a puller on a counter trade uh, gap run, or he was a zone blocker, and he is just not only able to get to where he needs to get to at 360 pounds, but throw these dudes to the side and absolutely bulldoze them. So as a run blocker, let me see what his run block grades is because we got it here. Um, as a gap run blocker over the last two years, he had a 66.0 run blocking grade, which is fine. As a zone blocker, when he was able to get these dudes moving, he could throw them off. At, and he he earned an 83.1 overall grade. What was so impressive to me when it came to his run blocking stuff is, Connor, there were multiple plays where Alabama played against um, Georgia where Latham is combo blocking Nazir Stackhouse and sends Nazir Stackhouse flying off of his feet to the ground. And I'm like, holy cow, that's some serious power. Now, love his finesse game for a player who is a, of his size. That play against Michigan, where he gets forklifted back way too far, it does happen a lot more than you'd like for it to happen. Yeah. His anchor ability, and I don't really understand. I need to watch a little bit more of it. I, it, it it's pad level because a lot of these guys just get under him and they win leverage, but I've seen him win with leverage before. So I, I just don't know why this is happening so often because I don't really think it's an inflexibility thing, but guys will get into his chest and they will push him back way more than you think that they should for a player of his size. He just doesn't have, I don't know, that density to his body. He's built really well. Obviously, it's 360 pounds, so he's, he's carrying a lot of mass, but a lot of it is in the butt, the hamstrings, the quads. He's got a lot in his lower body, but it's not like he's carrying a, a ton of unnecessary fat in the midsection. I just think he's a really well-built 360 pound. And so for him to struggle with bull rushes as much as he does, that was a little bit of a concern to me because it happened continuously. Now, there's also penalties. He was one of the most penalized players that we looked over. He had 18 penalties over the last two years, which is something that you absolutely got to clean up. Now, some of them were false starts, but some That's of them the were. Prob- That's a part of the problem, though. What, him jumping early, you're saying? Dude, it's it's not, I, I was my, not number one, but a thing that drove me nuts this summer, I had him at tackle five. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it really got a lot better this year, honestly. Him just, him, him jumping early to like, yeah that outside shoulder yes Mm. like i didn't see self-trust so let's see i actually have it right here i could pull it up latham's total penalties this year seven of them were false starts not great six of them were offensive holdings Three of them were ineligible downfield player. I saw those because I was like, what happened here? Well, yeah. On the coach's tape, it was a little hard to like figure out what was going on. One of them was unnecessary roughness. One of them was unsportsmanlike conduct. So uh, a decent amount of offensive holding penalties over the last two years. And then, yeah, a bunch of false starts. Let me see what it was in just 2023. So in just in 2023. Like, I think like I got watched three false starts. Let's see. Two false starts, two offensive holding. Yeah, so he's a lot more penalized the previous season. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, he had like no, but, Yeah, look, I, and and the thing is that I, I don't believe he needs to do all those things. I think he's right. gifted enough um, to not have these penalties, but he does. So that's something that he's absolutely got to clean up. There's no question about it. But the the reason why I ended up being as high as I am on him is because though there are things to clean up, he's going to be, I think, 21 his entire rookie season. Yeah, he's young. He, he's got two years of starting experience as a right tackle in the SEC, and he's got some straight-up dominant reps for a player of his size. He's going to win with length. He's going to win with size. The foot quickness is there for him. I think he is. He can be a devastating run blocker. The things that bug me the most are just the penalties. And for some reason, he struggles against those bull rushes. And I think it might be because he dips his head a little bit. We that's got to get a little. That's got to get better from him. But there's two. There. I, I again. I thought I was going to be more closer to where you had him. And when I watched him, there's too much good for me to go. Yeah, there's stuff that I like, but I'm going to hold him back. If I was an NFL team, I'd, I'd still be taking him in the first round. So for me, and I get it, I really do, because 
the I, I've written down before, like he is such a high variance player at a position that I honestly hate variance now. I do, and I used to not be this way, but I've been burned by evaluating offensive linemen where the highs are so unbelievable. Yeah. But the lows are, he's going to get demolished at the NFL level if those moments appear. So Mm -hmm. with Latham, I mean, his best tape is as good as anyone in a great class. His worst tape, you look around and you're like, man, how are we even talking about him being a top 40 pick that's and that's that's what everybody's thought was after the Michigan game right? because a lot of people hadn't seen him play and they've been sold that he's going to be a top 15 pick but yeah but and still and that's like, not yeah, fair either I don't think well, that's fair either but to, but to your point that that is the play of the game it is fourth and goal you, like you got one play to either extend the game or your season's over and man that play was so weird too I went back and yeah, did you watch that play with the all 22 afterwards? He peeks into he peeks to his left. That the reason why his chest is so open on that play and why he gets forklifted so so bad is because he looks to the left and he and he puts his arm out to the left as if he thinks the interior defensive lineman is maybe gonna cut in between him and the guard, or maybe he thinks like a a, a stunt is coming, which I don't think he believes a stunt is coming. Maybe he j- he's just trying to protect the gap so the guy doesn't immediately shoot the gap right in between him and the guard and get right to Jalen Milrow. But that split second where he turns his head to look at the interior defensive lineman is going to come at him. By the time he looks back around, that edge rusher is going reckless abandon yeah. right into his chest and ends up ruining the play. So even that play was a little bit weird, but you are right. Those moments where he struggles – are unfortunately impactful ones it's not just like ah you just missed it a little bit here sometimes it's really devastating yeah some of the things with him besides the penalties i, I you just brought this up field awareness um i thought was was a problem he just doesn't bring his feet with him in pass protection a lot he's so big and strong and he has maybe the strongest hands of any tackle in this class that it almost leads to bad habits at times where when he doesn't bring his feet, guys will cross his face or they'll get him with speed or a counter move. He's an interesting one, man. It's it's really, really difficult because he has a lot of ability that the best, nastiest run-blocking linemen in the NFL do. And he also has a lot of the issues that some of the biggest bu- first-round offensive line busts have as well. So... Yeah, I didn't have him in my top five. I know he's going to be a really popular player. Um, I just I just got afraid of the variance of, of two years of tape. Uh, obviously, this is not the last time that you and yeah. I watch tape on these players. And so we'll see. But uh, again, I, I thought I was going to be in your camp or closer to kind of where you had him on the rankings. And there's there's to me, there's just too much good. Um, even with the bad, it's like, damn. I'd still probably I'd still take this guy in the first. I just think that he's he's just too talented. And um yeah, so that's where I landed on him. We got the top three coming up, but before we get to that, this year it's the new year. You gotta start by securing your family's financial future, right? That starts with life insurance. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it quick, easy, and affordable to protect your family so you can get back to enjoying life. It was designed by parents for parents to help you get high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policies in less than 10 minutes. They got flexible policies that'll fit your family's budget with quality policies like million dollars for like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in just minutes and apply whenever it is convenient for you all online and to you guys' schedule. You can go from start to cover it in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash stock exchange. That is meetfabric, M-E-E-T. Just to make sure fabric.com slash stock exchange trying to save you guys out there policies issued by western southern life assurance company uh not available in certain states prices subject to underwriting and health questions we should buy meatfabric.com but m-e-a-t and it just i agree and underwear it just, it, it, no it just redirects to the page the youtube page it's not a bad idea you know we could literally sign off every pod by being all right thanks guys like subscribe uh or follow our links you know meatfabric.com <laughs> like what 
the hell's wrong with you guys? See, then people then people can make sure that they're going to the right place, whether they, you know, it's meet M E T or M E A T. Exactly. We just, you know, we we could help the people out before they get into trouble. There. That's our goal of this show. All right, who's offensive tackle three for you? You know who it is. It's Taliza Fuaga from Oregon State. Let's go, baby. Yeah. Wow. Go, what a baby. what a year for Taliza Fuaga. Honestly, two year right. starter, right tackle. Uh, was good last year, but was great this year. And mm-hmm. I think that says everything about Fuago, who's 6'6", 335. Like, just once again, mountain of a human. House. House. Good weight. Honestly, really good build on him. I'll jump into the notes here. Um, okay. Fuaga. I mean, number one, you just start with team captain. A big, thick generates power from head to toe I, I'd follow, I, I, team captain i'd follow this man into battle yeah i would too it'd take, just it'd, about it'd, any battle it'd take me three reps and be like all right cool we're we got the right guy actually yeah, so. you're, <laughs> you're the first off the bus so he's the guy at the coin toss who's just staring at the other team doing the thing where he's just like swaying side to side but the the ref asks him a question and he just doesn't answer he's right just, he just he, he will might not, nod he will not break eye contact with his opponent that's he might he wonder. might not he might not he might give you absolutely nothing so he's a player that a lot of these guys are big and strong but they get a little reckless to how they try to generate power whether they're leaning ducking he just generates power from head to toe mm-hmm. like you you could see it in his waist you could see it in his upper body uh another guy that does not get beat by power the core strength in the anchor is a plus for Fuaga. I mean, guys could try. They could lengthen their runway. They can go wide nine. They could stand up and they'd be like, I'm going to go speed to power. And they just get stopped in their tracks by this dude. So that's a great baseline for him to have because it's going to force guys to get more creative with their rushes. Where he got beat was by inside moves. I saw him get beat by an inside spin and stutter step where they try to would try to cross his face where he set a little bit wide and he wouldn't necessarily have the agility to cut off the inside. Now I will say this, Trevor, I think it's something that he's gotten better at throughout his time there. I think he's gotten better at as he's gotten more playing time. His awareness of stunts and blitzers is also still work in progress. That was something where I was like, okay, he's a little late a couple of times. Now what you need to recognize is too, especially he's not playing with, a quarterback that's going in the first round. Some of that too is on the quarterback as well, not identifying pressures or like, it wasn't one of those things where I'm like, man, it's so obvious and he's not seeing it, but there was just times where a pressure package or a stunt and he was late. Why he's one of the best offensive linemen in this draft, his ability in the outside zone game outside, Mm -hmm. like the running game is elite. He's quick off the ball. He's got length to cut guys off. He can reach block and he can dump defenders. He hits the strike zone. And this, he could also do this in man blocking. Like he can get off the snap and just drive block guys into the ground. He, and it's consistent. He had a 91.7 grade as an outside zone run blocker. Yeah. I, I mean, that, like he, there's not a lot of bad reps with him on the move. And you look at a guy that's 6'6, 335, and you're like, and he plays right tackle. Everybody's like, oh, I like him, but you know, is he all power? We're we just gonna have to run downhill. When I, I was so su- pleasantly surprised with what he does when they have him climb, when they have him reach, when they have him get outside. So Fuago, who keeps getting better in pass pro, but is already a standout run blocker. Stand out run. He's a let me say this: he is a better run blocker than Olu Fashanu. Oh, like I, it's and not it is close. not close. No, not close right now no so now we'll get to olu in a bit of why he, you know what makes him special but fuaga a lot of people keep asking me like all in fashanu and i get it I, i've been in a blender trying to separate those two fuaga is not in this tier that's out on mars like somebody's gonna take fuaga i think unless he just bottoms out in the testing i don't see that anymore in the top 12 to 15 and be like damn if this guy was in a normal offensive line class he'd be that dude he would be that dude. So I know, and I know you've been really high on him too. You were one of the first people to ever text me about him months ago. Uh, he, he's he's a great player. 
and one that if you know what you are identity wise, like in the run game, you're just going to absolutely love plugging him in right away. I think he is the Peter Skaronsky type of player for this year's draft. I also have him at offensive tackle three. So obviously this is an easy conversation. And I think our top three is maybe going to be the same. Maybe we'll have a different number one. Maybe. I, but I, yeah, here's the thing. Like, I think he's the Peter Skaronsky conversation of, I think he's a starting caliber offensive tackle. I think he's a starting caliber offensive guard. Like, it doesn't matter. I think that this guy is starting at the pro level one way or the other, uh, one way or another. I think he's got the foot speed to be able to survive at offensive tackle. But here's the thing. I don't know exactly what Fuaga's measurements are, but he's listed at 6'6", 335. So let's say he measures in at like 6'5 and a half, 330, whatever. Skronsky's measurements were 6'4", flat, 313. So this guy does what Skronsky does, but he's taller, he's bigger, he's got more length. So yep. if you debated this with Peter Skronsky, is he a tackle, is he a guard, which obviously the Titans put him at guard right away, then he's going to be a damn good guard. This guy gives you a lot of what you were missing from Skronsky in terms of length. Now, I will say this, because I agree with you 100%. I think he's just an absolute mauler in the run game. His finishing mentality as a pass blocker and as a run blocker is just, it is a it is a thing of beauty. I, the first line that I have in my scouting report for him is, Fuaga is the kind of ass kicker that every single team in the NFL wants on their trenches. 100%. Every single team. Does not matter. Don't care what your thresholds are. Don't care what your run in zone gap. What I don't care if you're a run first team, a pass for team. What you want this guy in the trenches because he is an absolute tone setter for you. I think that his I think that his feet are fast. I think that his hands are fast. I think he loves to take the fight. You mentioned earlier in the podcast takes the fight to guys. That's something I loved about Darnell Wright last year, and I see that same mentality for Fuaga. Now, of course, I see them a little bit the same in that they can get a little over aggressive you can get a little overzealous you can extend a little bit and that's can sometimes get you in a little bit of trouble but i think it's okay you know the longer he plays this the more he gets to the pro level the more he he understands the pro level strength what he could do what he could get away with his confidence level i think that that'll be all right you'll live with some with the overzealous tendencies for what he gives you as an aggressive player in the other parts of his game as a pass protector taking the fight to guys as a run blocker absolutely erasing people out of the game so really like all of that stuff from him i think that in pass protection he he has fast feet but his you could tell like he doesn't have a super long stretch or flexibility in his groin so that kick slide especially on those vertical sets they're not covering as much ground as it is for other players. He just doesn't have the longest legs. Is like you'll watch guys like we'll talk about Olu Fashano. We'll talk about Joe or uh, Joe Alt. Yeah, these guys. I mean, they're just covering all sorts of ground with their kick slides because their strides are just so big. Fuaga's not the same way, so he makes up for it with really quick feet, but. There are times when he gets exposed a little bit with the outside shoulder or against really good speed rushers. Sometimes he over he oversets himself a little bit, gives up that inside shoulder a little bit just because he, he can't quite get to the landmarks as fast as the other, these other guys that have longer stride lengths. However, unlike some guys where that might be the case and they struggle to recover, he has the fast footwork to be like, okay, if you if I didn't get to my landmark and you tried to hit me with an inside counter, he does get into them and has the strength to redirect them well. Right. Some guys, some guys just don't have that strength, right? If they can if they can redirect and they can get back into your chest, but they're already winning to the inside, maybe they're not going to be able to push these players enough to get away from the quarterback. Fuaga has that ability. He has that innate strength. So I think where his weaknesses certainly exist for questions of whether or not he can play tackle, I believe the strengths that he has in his game mitigate that more than maybe this conversation that we have had with other players. Like I think of Graham Barton, right? Where Graham Barton loved the footwork, loved the grip strength, but I don't know if Graham Barton exactly has that redirect ability that Fuaga does, where that's why I'm confident for him to be a good offensive tackle at, at the next level. So Man, I, I I am glad that you said it the way that you did. I wonder if this podcast is going to be one of the podcasts that's a little bit higher on Talise Fuaga because I'm not going to lie. I'll spoil it now. I got Olu at two. 
the debate between Fuaga and, and Olu was was kind of tight for me because I am not worried whatsoever about this guy having the strength and power profile to play at the NFL level. Sometimes I worry about that a little bit with Olu and kind of the way that you were talking about JC Latham. You don't you don't like entrusting guys who maybe have that kind of deficiency to them. I'm just I'm not worried about this guy being strong enough to play at the pro game. He's a pro trench player, and you've seen it over the last two years, and I absolutely love it. Now, an issue from him before I before we move on. Penalties. He had six penalties, or sorry, eleven penalties over the last two years. Eight of them were those false start penalties. Right. Now, not all eight of them, because I watched all of them. Not all eight of them are him trying to get a jump in pass. No. In fact, I think more than half of them is he's so eager to to get off the line and kill somebody. Yeah, it's a Kentucky (laughs) Derby in the gate. Like, let me out. Let me out. I want to run. So I'm not nearly as worried about his false starts as I am some of Latham's that might be more pass protection related. He's not having that kind of a thing. So I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that as well. I had the same thought, and that is taking us to a great conversation that I guarantee everybody listening right now is a little surprised that we both ended up with Joe All as the top tackle. Wow. Over, Look over at that. Time. I pro- I, Look, this, folks, I Trevor, don't, we don't text each other for a reason, no. and it's for moments but like this. As I sat there last night, I even tweeted it into the atmosphere. Like, I am oh, I saw it. so torn. Because I like them both so much. I I guess we'll start with Olu, right? Before we get to all. With Olu, and I think you kind of already hinted at this, for all his greatness, and he is a great pass protector. Like his floor in pass protection almost made me put him at one because I feel so good about it. But the play, he's still getting stronger. Mm -hmm. And I think the Ohio State game opened up my eyes a little bit to that. It was almost jarring, right? Like, it was almost like watching someone that you thought was like Rocky IV. It's um, with, what's his name? The Russian boxer. I can't believe this is driving me that nuts. But I'll get there in a second. Ivan Drago. Yes, thank you. Like, like he, he... he finally sees his own blood. And it's like, what? That was watching Olu against Ohio State. You're like, I thought this guy was titanium. And it's not that he got murdered. I want to make this very clear. It's it's not like Fashanu was unplayable against no. Ohio State. It's just that he's been so good since he's been on the field for Penn State that it was, you know, it was a little bit um, surprising in a way. But besides that, I think with Olu, his, his run blocking right now is just not where it needs to be for an elite play. Like a all time kind of pl- prospect. I mm-hmm. think. I think that he's he's a great athlete. He can absolutely fly in the open field. He has no fear or lack of urgency or, um, you know, drive. But he just doesn't consistently generate lower body power as a drive blocker. And in the zone game, he plays high and doesn't sustain blocks. Like he just misses his landmarks and doesn't sustain guys. He might make the first contact, but a guy is going to work through him or around him or over him. So it's not, it's not that he's an unplayable run blocker. I want to make sure like we're really nitpicking a great player here in Fashanu, but I was, it was the one thing I wanted more out of from summer scouting. Mm -hmm. And I think it got better this year. I don't think it got a lot better. And I was disappointed by that. Really disappointed by that because this is a dude that built in a lab, so explosive in pass pro, so good in pass pro, can play on an island with the best of them, and that is going to make him an NFL starter right away and a really good one, like one I would love to have on my team. Mm -hmm. But if he wants to be an all pro player, which is what I think a lot of us have been billing him his potential as, the run game, it has a few steps to continue to grow. I agree. I agree with you on uh, on a lot of what you said. Uh, just expounding a little bit on his background. So uh, funny, he I, I love looking up when guys were multi-sport 
you know, athletes growing up and Olu wanted to play basketball. Yep. Uh, actually, he said, quote, all my life, I always played basketball. Uh, but as I got older, uh, I was just the big center who was out there to rebound and play defense. And I didn't really enjoy that as much. So uh, kind of a little hint into, all right, he just he, he didn't want that kind of a game. He didn't want to be a paint player nearly as much. So switches over to football, which is funny because in the trenches, it's literally only paint play um, basically your entire career. Another interesting tidbit about him, I read. He so okay. He is six foot six, three hundred twenty pounds. Both of his parents are five foot eight. Yeah, <laughs> it's wild, isn't it? What happened? I don't know, man. Did he take the super soldier Captain America serum? I hope got Kristen and State? I get that lucky. I really do. That like, actually, I just have this child that's like <laughs> eight inches taller than me, and I'm like, yes. <laughs> that actually would make sense for Penn State because Penn State has so so many freak athletes. Maybe Penn State does have the Captain America serum. Maybe they maybe they actually do have. Yeah, I, I'm starting to believe it when you watch these guys athletically. So to talk about like how athletic this dude is, he was on uh, Bruce Feldman's freak article going into the season. Um, they said that he Olivashano at six six three twenty ran a four nine seven forty yard dash, which would be ninety third percentile for offensive tackles, and at a short shuttle time of four six three, which would be seventy third percentile. Um, this was all this summer. So truly just pretty rare athletic movements. And, and you mentioned how great the pass protection is. Over the last two years, so this is both 2022 and 2023. This is across 1,200 snaps total. So these aren't all pass blocking snaps, but raw pass blocking grade, 89.2, damn near elite. Pass blocking grade on true pass sets. So you're taking a lot of out of like the gimmicky stuff, the quick throw stuff, the RPO stuff. Like you're taking a lot of that out. These are true drop back passes uh 84.4 pass blocking grade which is great but then you go to the run game you mentioned over the last two years run blocking grade in gap man gap plays 67.2 run blocking grade in zone blocking concepts 65.8 so neither one really great and here's the one that bothers me the most so we have some advanced stats at pff and we have these things that are called stable or unstable metrics and we categorize them as such and not every single metric falls into one of these two buckets, but some more than others fall into them. And we like to categorize them appropriately because not every data point is as translatable as another. They're all valuable. They all help tell the story, but not the, the stable metrics that we have are the ones that we deem as the most translatable. The good players at the next level at this position typically show good scores grades in these areas when it comes to the run game for offensive tackles avoiding negatively graded plays is the more stable metric than even saying okay what about a positively graded play because the negatives are more translatable or more consistent from yep. year to year it tells you more about the player it paints the clearer picture for Olu Fashanu. He had a negatively graded play percentage of 12.9 over the last two years. That's just in the 10th percentile. So obviously not closest to 100 is, is what you want to get. 10th percentile, 12.9% of you have a negatively graded run blocking plays, that's not great. And then when you marry that with him struggling with power when it comes to pass protection, it gets me nervous, man. And that's why I had a debate in my head about Talize Fuaga above mm. Olu Fashanu because I'm not worried about that with Fuaga. Now, Fuaga doesn't cover near the ground that 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 Olu does. He's not near the pass protector he is, but the floor, what I know he is going to be as a run blocker first and foremost, and then the type of player he is as a pass blocker, is that worth it over a guy that I got, I got strength question marks? I got strength question marks with him in the run game. I got strength question marks with him in the pass blocking game. Phenomenal finesse player. And this is probably the best. I, I want to read my full scouting report on, on Olu because I think it does a, a good job of kind of encapsulating what I think about the dude. So here it is. If the saying is true that offensive linemen are the best athletes on the field, Fashanu is a poster child for it. His finesse and pass protection game is so impressive for how fast his feet are and how well he moves. This has yielded very good pass protection grades over the last few years. The power profile for him, however, is adequate, but not elite. He just does not pack a punch of contact in the run game, despite being 320 pounds. It has some flexibility and foot issues, foot speed issues, 
that don't allow him to maintain blocks in the run game. I assume that he uses low hand techniques to make up for that lack of natural pad leverage at six foot six. And it also increases his strike zone when the hands move up, as well as it keeps his hands low. So pass rushers cannot knock them away from, from his body as they are coming into him and getting into their pass rush moves. However, these low hands expose his chest far too often. And for a player who is not as dense as an anchor, this appears to be a source of much of what he is dealing with right now when it comes to his struggles versus power rushers. When he gets his arms up, and even even against good speed to power players, he can't anchor. The long arms are a big advantage to him when he's keeping pass rushers at bay, but failing to keep his arms inside makes his chest too easy to attack, and right now he is not dense enough to anchor immediately, and that forces pressure on the pocket for how he takes on power rushes. So just, I, we, we've talked so much about how good Olu Fushanu is, but the power profile to his game to me is still at a point where I ended up with Joe Walt as my number one tackle, simply put, because I don't have that worry with him. So before we talk about all, I, I do want to get to an ad read, but I want to make sure if there was something else that you wanted to talk about with Fashanu, I gave you the floor before I got into that. No, I just want to hammer home how excited I am about Fashanu as a pro prospect, because I think a lot of people listening right now are like, it's almost like a gut punch because Fashanu has been, was talked about as a top, a pick if he declared last year. And he's still probably going to be, right? He goes back. He's still going to be a top eight pick. He's yeah. still really good. He's a special pass protector, yep. athlete, length. Yep. Per, it sounds like person. Like when you hear teammates talk about him and team captain. And I think he'll be on a, a, a foundation of an offensive line for a decade in the NFL. But it just came down to who has the higher ceiling because of what they do in the run game right now. My final bottom line of Fashanu was Fashanu is not only incredibly talented, but will also be one of the youngest prospects in the 2024 That's class, point. which is important because if it's a guy, you know, kids, right? We talk about these guys being kids. He's 20 years old. He's 21 years old. He's probably going to get a lot stronger. At least he has the ability to get a lot stronger. Certainly when you look at his age, he is the type of athlete in the trenches that you absolutely draft in the first round. Very high. Even if he needs to get stronger, to live up to his very, very high potential. So there you go. That's our thoughts on on, on uh, Olu Pashani. We'll get to our Joe Alt breakdown in a sec. But NFL fans, it is time to unwrap the nonstop football action this holiday season by throwing down big matchups with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. This week, new customers can bet just 5 bucks on the NFL and score 150 in bonus bets instantly you can download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now get in on all of the NFL playoff action there's some already some juicy lines to get into look with quarterbacks and players you know sitting that guys resting to there's a lot of room for you to make some money there's a lot of lines that are very flexible here if you think you've got to be a beat on what these teams are going to do when it comes to this final weekend of the NFL season you, there is there is money to be made that's all I'll say so go ahead go ahead and do that download the sportsbook DraftKings Sportsbook app now with the promo code PFF. New customers can bet just $5 on NFL action, score 150 instantly in bonus bets. Only in DraftKings Sportsbook uh, with the promo code PFF. The crown is yours this season. If you got a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Visit www.1800gambler.net in New York. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, help is available for problems with gambling at 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort. 21 plus age varies by juris jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash football for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gambling resources. Both got Notre Dame left tackle. Three-year left tackle. Very, very impressive yeah. for two freshmen to play. At that left program? Uh, it's, so we got Joe Alt at number one. Talk to good people about Joe Alt. Well, I think first off, what's so wild about it is I, all, all the guys you've heard us talk about today, um, Latham, Mims, like the, they were some of the best recruits in their entire class. Not a tackle in the entire class, counting the quarterbacks, counting mm -hmm. the other positions. I don't think Alt was viewed that way coming into the school that he would be this instant three year starter, right? He's, four, he's only a four star. Okay. I thought he was a three. I mean, but either way, 
the hype was different. Like, there's a million four stars every year. This guy started eight games as a freshman at left tackle, then 13 as a sophomore in 2022, mm-hmm. and then all 12 this year. Yeah, he's played over 2,000 snaps, over 2,100 snaps in college on the offensive line. He's only had four penalties in his three years of starting. Nuts. Two false starts and two holds. Nuts. That's insane. Nuts. And they, like, you watch his true pass sets. They ask a lot of him, Trevor. They really do. This is a guy that, like, he's out on an island. Oh, it's a true drop back offense it's like that. Yes. 100% where I'm yes. like, this is what playing tackle in the NFL is going to be like. He is phenomenal at recognizing and picking up stunts and communicating with his teammates. I wrote down specifically from summer how unfazed he was by Miles Murphy trying to rush against him with power. And then this year, one of my favorite edge rushers that actually went back to school, Ashton Gelati on Louisville, he looked really good against that front as well. All is a big time player plays up to competition because he is the competition. And there's really not a lot of weaknesses in his game. Like I it's, over summer, there was some hand placement questions for me in pass pro. I thought he refined that this year. He's the size of a skyscraper, so there's times where it's like leverage. You're thinking, okay, right? is he going to get out leveraged by the 6'1 bursty bendy rusher? But he's a good athlete at his size. He can bend his knees. He doesn't you know, tip over. He doesn't duck. He doesn't overreach. Uh, he's got great length. Inside zone, he just erases people. If you ask him to drive block and just push people backwards, he does that. When they have him open up and run as a puller, he does that. He's not beat a lot in pass pro. He sustains blocks so well. Guys, when they counter him, he always knows what to do with his hands. He brings his legs with him. He's got a very strong core. He's got a good anchor. He'll, sometimes he'll slide back, but then he... he recalibrates and readjusts and he locks into the ground. He's, uh, I mean, he, my favorite tackle I've ever evaluated is Penny Sewell mm-hmm. in that draft. I had him as the number two player behind Trevor Lawrence. All is, I think every bit as good as Penny Sewell as a prospect. Like that is how good of a prospect he is that he's at least tied for the best tackle prospect I've watched. High praise, but worthy worthy of the high praise. we uh what is it we pray at the the alt <laughs> i'm swinging a miss <laughs> i saw what you're going for i see the vision it yeah. didn't manifest itself but you i know, hope we, that's not the we, open we gotta go back <laughs> <laughs> i really hope that's not the open i might need a week off I'm all right hiding. <laughs> you know it's gonna be the open. i'm going into hiding ryan's gonna punish you so yes. hard for that one uh, yes. okay so well earned so <laughs> a little bit of background on Joe Wall. Um, started his high school career. Well, first and foremost, family background. His father, John, played in the NFL for the Kansas City Chiefs, and his older brother, Mark, is an, NH- an NHL defensive. So, I mean, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> I, like, right, 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 right. So Joe Wall started in high school as a freshman quarterback before moving to linebacker and defensive end as a sophomore. And then he moved to tight end as a junior. Notre Dame offered Joe Wall a scholarship as an offensive line prospect after watching his junior season when he played tight end at 240 pounds. By the time he committed to the Irish, he was nearly 260 pounds. And by the end of 2021, when all had signed with Notre Dame, he weighed nearly 280. So now he is listed at 322, six foot eight. 322 pounds. So not only does he have a athletic family background, he's got a multi-position background. I'm sure he played multiple sports growing up. I talked about some of played hockey. He's probably from played hockey. He probably played hockey. Probably played highlight. Probably was in NASCAR. I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't doubt him. We talked about some of those stable metrics that PFF has. I'm going to list you off all of the stable metrics that we have here. Pass block grade. Over the, now, these are over the last two years. He's played 1,600 snaps at left tackle over the last two years. So this is a cumulative score for over the last two years to play for him. Pass block grade, 89.0. Pass block grade on true pass sets, 82.1.
Run blocking grade in gap plays, 83.0. Run blocking grade in zone plays, 93.4. Negatively graded run plays, just 7.2%. That's in the 89th percentile. Total penalties over the last two years, three. Where's the bad? What what find. what are we what are we I mean he's just he's such a great prospect he has such a great high IQ of what wins at the position um he's got despite being 6 foot 8 he's got really good hamstring flexibility to be able to get down in that three point stance because Notre Dame asked their offensive linemen to all get in three point stances when you're doing run plays so he's got that flexibility even though his butt's pretty high in the air cuz he's 6 foot 8 he can get his pad level low and get his hand on the ground because he has that hamstring flexibility. So the hands are very consistent and powerful in their punches. Um, he's just an extremely impressive, fluid athlete coming from that linebacker, tight end background that you're now seeing at left tackle. The, I mean, he's just he's got great awareness. He's always looking for extra work. He's very calm in his pass sets because he knows that a lot of people just aren't going to be able to get around him with his sheer size, certainly when he pairs that with his technique. So you don't see a lot of panic from him. But – if I had to say that th there were things that I noted in his game that make him not the perfect prospect, one, the groin flexibility. I talked about this a little bit with Talise Fuaga, where the total um, stretch that you have when you were in your kick slides, it's a little bit stiff, but he's six foot eight. So he covers plenty of ground anyways, even if it's not this long stretch that it might be for some of these other guys like Ola Fushano and like I've seen with J.C. Latham, players like that. So the groin's a, a little bit stiff, but it's not really anything to worry about because he's got the overall size. He does have a little bit of a tendency to overextend. You know, he will kind of get his shoulders over his skis, if you will, when he is trying to dictate contact, when he's trying to get his hands in there. And there are times when if the rusher is really patient with him or if they're trying to bait him, he can get a little off balance and get a little top heavy and you can kind of manipulate him a little bit that way. But that's more of a consistency thing than anything else. I'm interested to see what his arm length ends up being because Despite him being 6'8", when I watch him, it's not like his arm length is is like a Marius Mims or something right. like that. He doesn't have vines for arms. Now, again, him having a 6'7", 6'8", frame, maybe it doesn't look like that. I think it's a trick of the eye. And it might be a total trick of the eye. But there are times where I go, okay, well, maybe your arms aren't as long as your six foot eight frame would indicate. And maybe that's a reason why you get a little top heavy. And when you lunge a little bit, you get your shoulders over your toes a little bit. But man, it's that stuff that it's just more confidence. Like he doesn't even have to do that. So, I mean, three-year starter, multi-positional background. He's got the frame. He's got the size. He's got the athletic family background as well. He understands the position so, so well. The football IQ is already so high for him. There's just not a lot that this guy does not do well. If I am drafting Joe Wall in even the top five, now I don't know if he's going to go top five in this class. We'll see what the final draft order ends up being and what the quarterback position ends up being. But – if I'm drafting Joe, Joe Alt in the top five, I am sleeping like a damn baby if I am the GM of that team on Thursday night getting ready for Friday. I'm just I, – I have no reservations about this guy in any offense with any team, and he's going to be a stud. I'm with you all the way. I mean, he's, he's a no-brainer pick on the offensive line. What a career he's had at the college level, and everything he does just screams that it'll translate well to the NFL. I mean, just uh, looking at the draft, like, and he might not be the first tackle taken. It could still be Fashanu. But, oh, for sure, yeah. But, man, it's it feels like when you have the Titans and Jets lurking at that 7 and 8 spot, yep. there's just no world where those two guys could fall past those those spots. I, like, they, they're, I think they're locked in its top eight picks, even with potentially four quarterbacks and a couple of receivers going. I would agree with you. I would agree with you for sure. Anybody else in the top five that we did not get to that you want to – shout out at all we already talked about your guy number seven with with latham but uh anybody else on the list yeah i mean i'll give a quick shout to tyler guyton he, he is such a ball of clay that i think that'll really excite a team maybe the end of round one maybe round two instead he's a great athlete he moves really well he's out there just kind he, of athleting dude to, for better or for worse uh, we talk about this class having really good athlete offensive tackles he is without question the best it's, and and that yeah. is truly saying something. We have really good athletes in this offensive tackle class, and it takes 
one game of Tyler Guyton to go, yup, you are truly different. He's a great developmental pick. Yeah, he is. Um, but just just so far away that I couldn't have him over those five guys. I had him at six. But yeah, that was the main one for me. What about yeah, he, you? He's the one who I have some extensive strengths and I have some extensive weaknesses. Right. And at the yep. end, it's just like he's too high variance of a player right now for you to stick out there in the NFL. But I mean, to me, Tyler Guyton's probably going to be a top 50 pick just because again, I think so. He is. He's crazy athletic. All I right. So two too. guys that I would love to give a shout out to um kieran amagaji the left tackle for yale got an ivy leaguer in here six foot five 325 pounds and i know what you're thinking you're probably like okay why are we talking about a guy who played at ivy league level competition well it's because he absolutely dominated <laughs> level of competition so this is somebody who you're going to hear more and more of as you start to dive into draft season I think he's a really good I really think I think he's a really good football player, man. Um, I think that he is somebody who can start at offensive tackle or he can start at guard. He started at left guard for every game in 2021 before moving to left tackle for 2022 and 2023. So he's got that versatility to him. He's put on more than 30 pounds since he was a recruit and got to Yale. So I think he's put on weight really well. He's a He's a really good athlete per, for a player his size. I think he's got really good strength. He plays with a little bit too high of a pad level, but a lot of the stuff that you would fix with him, either it will get fixed on its own through snaps and time in the NFL, or you can alleviate that by putting him at guard. I just think that he's got starting caliber potential at either position. He is somebody who I really, really liked and um, over the last two years. Pass blocking grade, 87.8. True pass blocking grade, 88.3. So this is somebody who um, is is a really good pass protector, but I'm, I'm excited to see him. I think he's at the Senior Bowl. Yep, I'm pretty he sure. Is? Yes, yes. Okay, so he's at the Senior Bowl, so he's another offensive lineman at the Senior Bowl. I'm really looking forward to watching. Uh, I thought. Is he not? I thought he was as well. I'm still going, still going. There's a lot of offensive linemen already committed. There, there are a lot of good offensive linemen. There really are. Uh, I wish I knew how to work a computer. Okay, hold on. I'll talk about I don't, it. No Yale. Uh, who knows? I thought okay. he was. So, redshirt senior Matt Gunclavis from Pittsburgh. He a is guy the, I have to watch still. I had him on the summer list, of course. So, he is somebody who I really like. Unfortunately, tore his ACL this season and, yeah. and missed most of this season. It was going to be pretty crucial for him. He is not imposing at anything, really. Um, he's listed at six foot six, 331 pounds, but... You know, not a lot of that weight, not as much of that weight as probably you would want in, in the lower half. So it's not like he's super dense with the lower half, but I just love how controlled he plays the position. I mean, the footwork is still super fast. He doesn't have as much ground as kick slides. He's not the greatest athlete. He's kind of like a low ceiling athlete when it comes to the NFL level. I don't think he's going to test really well, but the hand usage is great. He's so calm and confident when it comes to that hand fighting. You know, like he, he loves, in fact, he loves it too much. He loves the hand flash move. He loves to like start kick sliding back and then boom, I'm flashing the hand to get the defenders to put their hands up. And then it's like, okay, boom, I got you. You may have gotten hands on me first, but I'm redirecting. I'm getting them off of you. And then boom, I'm right into your chest. And now I'm controlling this situation. So he, 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 he wins so well with football IQ. Um, I just think again, he's super controlled. I, I think he's he's got a flat back, so he's got really great power going all the way up from his feet through his posterior chain into his chest, into his arms. It's just such a fluid motion for him. And he's just a lower ceiling athlete. So I don't think he's gonna get drafted super high. But man, I think this guy'd be a great mid-round pick. Third round pick, fourth round pick would be great value for him because I think he's got the ability to be a really nice swing tackle for you. He's played right tackle. He's played left tackle during his time at Pitt. This would be a fantastic depth player in his first year or two in the league, maybe even uh, evolving to a starting caliber player. I think that that is, that is well within reason. He's one of those guys that you watch. You know how like sometimes we'll get those offensive linemen in the NFL and they're just like late round picks, like anything, like third, fourth, fifth round picks, and they end up just being such a solid starter at offensive tackle. And you go, man, how do we miss it on this guy? I feel like Gonclavez is one of those players who it's like, not going to wow you with the testing. He's not like this, you know, you're not going to look at him and be like, whoa, future pro player. But he just gets it. He just gets yeah. how to win at the position. Last guy I'll shout out, um, Blake Fisher, the right tackle for Notre Dame. So the guy that's playing on the opposite side of the football from uh, from Joe All. 
not as clean in his finesse game and his pass protection game as he needs to be yet but a very powerful player. Another player that I'm not worried about the strength part of his game. He is somebody who I would take somewhere on day two. Really nice investment player. Wasn't even sure if he was going to declare for this draft, but he ended up doing that. And I think that the baseline of a power profile that you got with this guy is a people mover and a mauler. He already showed some nice improvements in the pass protection game. I think you might have yourself uh, a, a starting a, 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 a starting potential kind of a player if you end up getting him somewhere on day two. So he's one of those day two names to watch out for as well. And this is just the tackles, folks. I mean, this is a really, really deep, strong tackle class. And we have a lot of exciting guards and centers to talk about too. And some guards with tackle flexibility. So yep. uh, it's like we said at the top of the show, it's so great to have a strong offensive line class for the balance of the NFL. Listen, man, this class is fun. This class is really fun. There's so many good guys at the premium position at spots. Quarterback, wide receiver, offensive tackle, edge rusher. There's so many it's good, a good draft at those premium positions, and we're going to keep working through a lot of them. But we would love to hear your thoughts on our thoughts when it comes to this offensive tackle position. Uh, obviously, our top fives and some of the other players that we give a shout-out to, best way to do that. Hitting us up in the comments on the YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash at NFL Stock Exchange. We are over 16 and a half. It's amazing. Thousand followers already. 20 by the draft. I'd love, man, if we get to 20 by draft, uh, well, man, we we already love you guys so much, but that would be wonderful for us. Love you more. Yeah, we, we, we would. We thought that we couldn't, but we absolutely do. If you are audio only, you can still hit us up uh, and get your opinions out there for us on X and uh, Instagram at Tampa Bay Trey at Connor J. Rogers. That is the best way to do that. But um, yeah, let us know as well what team that you want to see next because we'll probably do a handful more fix your franchise. Cause it's January now, folks. The so Bears we, one is coming for everybody. The Bears, we we will tell we you hear, the Bears one you. is coming. We yes, hear you. yes, yes. It might be coming on Monday, depending on Monday. yeah. If you guys are uh, if you guys are vocal in the chat again, maybe we 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 just cannot deny it any longer. Plus, we'll obviously get to see where the Bears are officially picking. With we know the Carolina pick at number one, but also where their pick is, and then we'll get into the Justin Fields conversation as well. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Maybe we're doing it on Monday. Maybe not. It kind of up to you guys. Let us know in the comment section. But uh, Connor, anything else before we get out of here? No, sums it up. I- I'm excited, man. We'll keep rolling through these position groups. Trevor and I, if you didn't already know or didn't expect it, will be boots on the ground at the Senior Bowl, at the Super Bowl, at the Combine. Uh, so a lot of good stuff coming to the feed. Yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a wonderful draft season. Appreciate you guys already rocking with us. Keep doing so, and we'll give you all the NFL draft content that you could ever want. I'm Trevor Sikama. That is Connor Rogers. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening to the NFL Stock Exchange podcast. We will see you for maybe fix the Bears episode on Monday.